Hi, I'm Pastor Kari, and I want to welcome you to our online worship service for Trinity Lutheran Church this week. And I want to take a minute to read two scriptures that are assigned for this week. And the reason is they're so intertwined together. They just go together so well. And so I'm going to um, talk about them both. So I'm going to start with the Exodus text. It is Exodus 16 and then 2 through 4, and then 9 through 15. And then we'll have a gospel reading from the Gospel of John. So the Exodus text goes like this. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill us, to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for the day. In that, in that way I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quail came up and covered the camp, and in morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. So that's our first reading from Exodus. Now, <laughs> I thought that I was going to die when we were out hiking the Humpback Trail. Now, it's part of the Superior Hiking Trail on the North Shore of Lake Superior in Minnesota. And it was this like super hot day and there was no shade to take a little break under. The trail was super rocky so we needed to be careful you know where we planted each foot. I looked up on the Minnesota DNR website how they rate this trail, the humpback trail. They rate it as very difficult. I would agree. It's very difficult and this is how they describe it. They say the humpback trail is very strenuous. Yes. Fittingly named the humpback trail leads you up and down the rolling terrain of George H. Crosby Manitou State Park. You'll encounter ungroomed and very rocky areas, high grades, and will climb large obstacles. Some trail signs are very faded or missing. Keep an eye out for bear signs posted to stay on the trail. Bear signs, B-A-R-E, not B-E-A-R. What? So I usually trust my husband to choose trails that will not kill me and our children. But this day tested that assumption. I mean, I sometimes, you hear those stories, right, about those people who, you know, took their day pack and maybe one little eight ounce bottle of water and like a granola bar and they went out and they ended up getting lost and they ended up in the wilderness for like three days or something having to sleep in a little dig out dugout area that they had to make for themselves i mean you you hear these stories it's kind of what i thought was going to happen it was brutal now we never got lost but we were nearing death it seemed when we ran out of water on this hot day, on this rocky terrain. 
And since then, the girls and I now rate every, every trail compared to the humpback. We're like, how difficult will this trail be? Will it be like the humpback? Or when we finish a trail, this one was worse than the humpback. Everything relates back to that day we went hiking and thought we might die. Not really, but. And so I can relate to the complaints of the Israelites as they were out in the wilderness, feeling like they were going to die, not trusting their leader, not trusting God. Yet it seems to be a bit ungrateful, considering that they're still damp from the crossing of the Red Sea when God delivered them from centuries of slavery. I mean, they, they barely dried off from crossing the Red Sea and they're complaining already that God isn't there for them. How quickly they have amnesia. But it's a fair complaint because they're not lost. Nobody took a wrong turn. Moses didn't lose sight of the manicured trail that the DNR takes care of. They're there in the wilderness hungry, scared, feeling lost because God led them there. God led them there on purpose and for a purpose. Now, since crossing the Red Sea, God has been leading them straight in to God forsaken territory through a cloud and fire. It's no wonder that they might be thinking that they're out there in the desert to die, that God has led them out there to die. And you know, they're not wrong. God has brought them out into the wilderness to kill them. Now, I know you, um, you want to hear an uplifting sermon. You want to hear hope. You don't want to hear that God led his people into the wilderness to kill them. I mean, there are no... Uh, cute TikTok songs or dances to go with a theme like that. You're not going to find a Hallmark card. Hey, sorry you're lost in the wilderness. God brought you out there to kill you. I mean, it's just not a very uplifting theme. But God has brought them to the desert for the desert to be the death of them. God has brought them to the desert so that their hunger could be the hospice through which God kills off their old selves. Here they are. <laughs> They're remembering their bondage in Egypt. For generations, they were forced to work. They were forced, they were whipped. They were tortured. They were forced to do whatever they needed to do according to Pharaoh to build up his empire. And yet, here they are and their memory is telling them that their years of slavery, their generations of slavery, that those were the good old days. And this is proof that they are not yet free. They are no longer slaves of Pharaoh, and yet they are still in bondage. So God brings them to the, des the desert for a different kind of deliverance. God says, hey, you guys like those stew pots in Egypt? Well, I'll give you quail. Quail is a far more, far more special meal. I mean, if the stew pots of Egypt are chicken nuggets, then the quail in the wilderness, well, that's lobster. God responds to their complaints with generosity. God responds to their laments with abundance. Now, I'm sure that their ungrateful complaining was at the very least annoying to God. And yet God gives them the opposite of what they deserve. Every day at twilight, when the quail appeared, God sent them a two-point message. First, lose your false memory about Egypt. I mean, there was nothing good for you there. That was just all bad. And second, I am not a pharaoh. Two-point message. First, lose your false memory about Egypt. 
that was nothing but bad for all of you. And two, I am not a pharaoh. Bread in the Bible is a reminder of the fall in Genesis. So every evening they eat this extravagant quail, but every morning they eat the opposite. They eat bread. They eat this reminder from the fall in Genesis. When Adam and Eve distrust God's word, distrust God's promise, and they eat from the tree of knowledge, and God sends them away from the garden, and God says, you shall eat bread. Now, in the garden, they ate fruit. You know, you just pluck fruit and it's ready to eat. There's no work, there's no sweat, and it's delicious. I mean, that's why it's my favorite snack. Fruit you just pick from the tree and it's ready to go. But bread, just before Adam and Eve are told to remember that they are dust and to dust they shall return, like we remember on Ash Wednesday, just as they are told to remember their death, they are told that they shall eat bread. Bread is laborious. I mean, have you ever harvested the grain and the, or the wheat and, and made your own bread? From the field to the table, I can't even tell you. I can't really even imagine what all of the parts would be. There'd be putting the seed out. There'd be tilling the land. There'd be waiting for it to grow. There'd be plucking the, the wheat. There'd be grinding it and separating out the part that's edible and the part that's not and then the kneading and the baking and the folding and the putting it in the oven and the waiting from the field to the table there's so much work to be done to make bread now most people i know who make bread use a bread machine right i mean that's how i would make bread if i was going to make bread because making bread from scratch, including harvesting the crop, is laborious. I mean, nobody I know goes out back to get some wheat to start the bread. There's harvesting and grinding and kneading and rising and folding and baking and harvesting and grinding and kneading and rising and folding and waiting and baking. But here, here we have God giving God's people bread from heaven, manna from heaven. God says to Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you. And as the dew clears, the people don't, the people don't even recognize what it is. They're like, what is it? Interestingly enough, manna in Hebrew means, what is it? And so the... He rains down bread from heaven and there is no, there is bread, but it doesn't require harvesting or kneading or folding or grinding or waiting or baking. There is nothing for them to do but receive it. Manna from heaven. Every morning what they had, what had been their work and sweat to perform becomes God's grace to provide. There is nothing for them to do except to trust that wherever they are, it will be there and it will be enough. It is this Exodus story that is in the minds of the people in our gospel reading from John. John chapter 6, starting with verse 24. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? <laughs> Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? 
What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. It is that story from Exodus that the people have in their mind as we read this gospel story from John, that they are remembering as they follow Jesus on boats. Jesus, the one who has just fed like a multitude of people with five loaves and two fish. There is something about filling their bellies that feels holy. It reminds them of the manna from heaven it must be of God. So they follow Jesus across the sea. Jesus says to them, Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life. So then they ask the question. The question. It's the question that I think we still ask 2,000 years later. It's the question we struggle to understand the answer to. We ask the question, what must we do to perform the works of God. I mean, what must we do? Should we pray more, read scripture more, spend less money, give more money away? What stuff do we have to do? Please tell us. Tell us, Jesus. What they want to know is, how do we make ourselves right with God? Jesus corrects their question and he says, this is the work of God. This isn't for you to do. This isn't about you. This is about the work of God. We so easily begin to think it's our work, right? I mean, that we have to do something, that we have to earn something, that we have to be good enough in some way. We have to trick somebody or find a loophole that allows us to connect with God, maneuver, maneuver our way to maybe outsmart God get in on a technicality with the big guy? Jesus jumps in to say, that's not a we question, that's a God question. That's the work of God alone. This is what stumps people. It's almost easier if we have a task list, you know, like give me a list and I'll just go through and I'll do everything on it and then I will know that I am right with God. Because trusting that God will do the work, trusting that God will love us, trusting that God will care about us even when we are complaining in the wilderness, even when we are failing in, by the world's standards, even when we are having a mental health, even when our mental health is causing us to struggle, grace, quail in the wilderness, Bread that requires no labor. It's all too hard to accept. I hear people sometimes reference the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament as if God is graceless in those pages. But then Jesus comes along and sort of invents grace and God is full of grace from the New Testament forward. But grace is God's DNA. God has been showering God's people with grace since God created the heavens and the earth out of grace. When there was nothing but grace. When God said to Abraham, you will be my people and I will be your God. When God led the Israelites out of slavery. When God fed them with quail and manna. When God came to earth in the form of a tiny baby that required the protection and nurturing of Mary and Joseph. When God went to the cross out of love, 
and out of his greatest desire, which was to conquer death once and for all, to eliminate all the barriers that might get between God and the ones God loves. Jesus Christ, this manna made flesh, has finished what was started in the desert of sin. God killed off the sin in you by drowning you in the waters of baptism so that now in you the gospel promise the gospel promises that you are a new creation. And so we receive that living manna from heaven and trust that he has done all of the work already. We trust that God's presence goes with us. We trust that wherever we are, God's presence will always be there and it will always be enough. In Jesus, in the bread from heaven, God gives us a two-point message. First, lose your false memory about being a captive to sin because that was nothing but bad for you. Second, God is not Pharaoh. God is not like any earthly or false God. He gives us a two-point message. Lose your false memory of being captive to sin because that was nothing but bad for you. And God is not Pharaoh. God is not like any earthly or false God. God's DNA of grace is the foundation of our identity. Our truest, deepest identity comes from outside of ourselves. We are children of God, not because of anything we've done, but because Christ has claimed us as such. And God unites all of God's children. The manna from heaven rained on the entire community. The quail appeared for the entire community. God showers his grace on all of God's children. He doesn't pick out individuals. God showers his grace on you and me and all of the children of God. And God wants unity for us. In an era when division is pulling us away from each other, and away from Christ, and away from our true identity in Him. Unity is found in our common calling and our common proclamation. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. And so we are unified by the manna made flesh. Not because we agree on everything, but because we have been called into the family of God together, united by this common witness. Jesus is Lord, God is grace, and God's grace is enough. Amen.